Welcome back to Module 6. This video is going to be a little bit brain melty as we talk about some of the big questions on what the universe is and how it got the way that it is. Uh, I haven't been reading out the learning outcomes at the start of each section, but I want to here because I want to make sure you understand that we're not trying to go into a lot of depth on this really intense topic. We want to list basic facts that astronomers have identified about the universe, and I will be kind of building a pyramid of these basic facts that will show up multiple times on the slide. And we want to describe the observations that led to our current understanding of the history of the universe. And that's consistent with our desire to always know why we think the things that we do in this course. What is it about our observations and experiments have, that have led to our hypotheses and theories? So try to focus on the, the basic pieces of information and kind of connecting what main observation led to each one of them. Let's get started. We're gonna be thinking about the following questions. What is the universe? Is the universe infinite? What is the universe made of? And how do we know all of this? Note that I didn't say we were gonna answer all of these questions. Some of these questions don't really have complete known answers yet. Uh, and it's very possible that humanity is not meant to fully uh, understand and appreciate the answers to these questions, but we are going to think about them. So let's start with a definition. And this is the definition that we're going to be building our, our whole understanding of. Uh, the universe has to be, by definition, everything. All of time and space. Everything there ever was, everything there currently is, and everything that ever will be. By defining it this way, we have to recognize that that means that there's nothing outside of the universe. And I don't mean a void, I mean that there's no definition that includes an outside, because if we have some bound, we have to include what's on both sides of that bound as the universe. So this has really important implications that lead to our first couple of kind of clear facts that we need to write down. Because there is no edge, um, or rather, because an edge implies a boundary between inside something and outside something, there cannot be an edge to the universe, the capital U universe. And if we were to think of some special single point that is the center, where everything seems to come from, that would imply that everything is then leading out away to some edge, the center of a circle is defined by the distance um, to the edge. So there's no center of the universe either. So let's make sure that we've got those written down. There is no edge to the capital U universe by definition, and there cannot then be a center to the universe, the capital U universe either. Already, these are big, big ideas that I, I want to make sure we recognize we're just trying to write down those basic statements, even if it's going to take some time to fully comprehend or appreciate them. And so when we get to the question of, is the universe infinite, there are two separate parts to that question. We want to know, is the universe infinite in size? And we've already hinted at that. And we actually have to realize that there's a separate part to that question. Is the universe infinite in age? Has it always exist? Will it always exist? And that's something that is important for us to disentangle as well. Now, because we've already identified that there's no edge and there's no center, the universe has to have an infinite size. There is a difference between... Um, the capital U universe that we're currently talking about, and the observable universe that we'll define later, but the true, actual, complete universe is infinite in size. So now let's talk about the idea of the age. If the universe extended in all directions and has always existed in that infinite size, um, then the night sky wouldn't be able to be dark. This simple little animation here uh, is kind of populating the, the space of a patch of sky with stars, um, just a simple little Photoshop. Um, but if the universe has always existed, then 
any single direction you look, no matter how far away those stars would be, you'd find stars and it would populate that part of the sky with light. So the fact that our night sky is dark can't work if the universe is infinite in both size and age. And this is referred to as Olber's paradox. It's actually a relatively straightforward paradox to solve though, because all we have to do is identify that the universe is in fact not infinite in age. It had a starting moment in time. We will give a name to that starting moment in time later in this video, but for now we want to recognize that that is what determines the observable universe the edge of what we have gathered light from. And so any graphic like this that is showing some edge to what we see is showing us the edge of the observable universe. How much of the infinite space that we could possibly see have we actually received light from so that it's viewable. So that's based on how old the universe is and how the universe is expanding. And there's four different uh, possibilities here. We're not going to get into the details too much on those. Um, but recognizing that whether the universe is expanding or contracting and how quickly that's happening, that determines uh, aspects of the observable universe as well, not just the speed of light. So we have two facts that we need to have written down in our notes as kind of our basic goal learning objective that we can list. The universe has an infinite size. We may put in parentheses that that reminds it to remind us that that means it has no center, it has no edge, but it does have a finite age. And we might make a note to ourselves that that determines the observable part of the universe. Okay, two facts so far, not so bad. Now, this finite age of the universe, astronomers actually have a pretty good sense of. As we gather more and more observations, we can kind of zoom in on getting more accurate uh, estimates, but we, we currently think that 13.8 billion years is the current age of the capital U universe. So we need a, a name for the moment in time where time itself started. That moment is called the Big Bang, although it's not a good name for it and it comes from a derogatory um, comment made on a radio show between a scientist of the opposing model, because really the Big Bang Theory, which is a phrase that everyone has heard, um, they named a TV show after it, honestly it should just be called the Expanding Universe Model. And that's what the scientists who were suggesting it in the 1940s were trying to call it. But by the 1960s, uh, it had gotten this, um, this name, the Big Bang, uh, and that name stuck. So everybody calls it that, uh, which is misleading and a little unfortunate because now we have to confront some misconceptions about it. All right, so we'll come back to those misconceptions, but let's kind of stay on track for right now. I showed those different models of how the universe expands or doesn't expand. Let's talk about that for a little bit longer right now. So we introduced the hubble lemaitre law in the previous section. It is the idea that each of the distant galaxies that we can measure a Doppler shift, a redshift for, the bigger and bigger redshifts are consistent with the galaxies that are farther and farther away. Now we have a couple of different models that we can use to help us try to picture what that really means for us. So we'll start with a single number line. If we have several ants on a rubber ruler where we have painted on the zero, two, four, six, eight numbers, if we stretch that ruler the way that we are stretching the universe, the ants don't have to walk around at all, but they have all moved apart. So it's not that the galaxies are kind of zooming through space on their own, but the space itself is being stretched out. And the ants that started really far away have gained a lot of distance. The ants that started close together have gained distance, but at a smaller amount. So this alone would already make a hubble um, Lemaitre law. We can also use a different analogy, uh, so trying to start to think in uh, three dimensions, because space is three-dimensional, uh, is a loaf of raisin bread. So the raisins are important because those don't gain size when the loaf itself expands. 
those would be like the galaxies. So if we were to live on any of these single raisins, if we looked at before the bread rose when we baked it and after the bread baked, every single raisin would be farther apart than our home raisin. And the ones that started close have gained a little bit of distance in that baking time. And the ones that started far away have gained a lot of distance in that same baking time, which means that they are moving farther apart that whole, that whole process. But any model that we try to make that is kind of easy to reference, that has um, its basis in our everyday um, objects, is going to have limitations. The bread clearly has an edge. The crust to it is even a different color in these, in these um, diagrams. The universe does not have an edge. So it makes it hard for us to imagine this like infinite loaf of bread, um, but we're doing the best we can with different pieces that we can pull together for our understanding. So there's an additional model that is often used, and I want you to think on this one uh, on your own for a bit. So imagine that we are talking only about the surface of a balloon, a balloon that we put more air into so the surface itself expands. Now for the model that we're going to have you think about, only the surface of the balloon exists in this model. So we aren't talking about the inside of the balloon, we're not talking about the air above it, as if we're an ant that can only ever exist on the surface of the balloon. So there are four characteristics of the real universe that we have already talked about. There's three dimensions of space, the universe has no edge, the universe has no center, and the universe expands. The universe is expanding. So I want you to pause the video to think um, about this question, and I've called it multiple choice because your options are 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. <laughs> Uh, how many of these characteristics are accurately represented by the surface of the balloon in this analogy? So pause to think through each one and kind of ponder uh, that idea. This also gives us a chance to kind of catch up on these big picture ideas. So the universe does have three dimensions of space. The surface of our balloon has only two dimensions. An ant could walk forward and backward, an ant could walk side to side, but in this analogy, an ant can't fly up or go into the balloon. So that one doesn't work. The universe has no edge. This one's important for us to really start to process here. If the ant were to walk around the surface of the balloon, it will never fall off an edge of the balloon. So that's well captured by this analogy. The universe doesn't have a center, and the balloon surface doesn't either. If we think about all of the different um, cities on the surface of Earth, none of them is the center of the Earth's global surface community. The ant will walk around and there's no special point besides the balloon tie itself, which we can, we can tape over. So the balloon surface doesn't have a center either, and that helps us process what it would mean to have something expand, yet not have an edge. There's a complete balloon surface at the beginning, there's still a complete balloon surface at the end, even though that surface has gotten bigger. That really helps us pull different parts of our understanding together, even though we can't make an expanding raisin bread balloon somehow work to really get a complete picture. We do the best we can with parts of this model, and that's as much as I'm asking you to do. So with the balloon analogy and drawing a little um, photon wavy line, we actually are now able to introduce a third type of redshift. So we introduced the Doppler redshift back in module three. So if an object or an observer is moving toward or away, uh, we can get blue shift and red shift from the Doppler effect. We introduced in module five, gravitational red shift. When we talked about being near a black hole, but not inside the event horizon, photons lose energy to that black hole. That came right after our discussion of spaghettification. And we're now introducing a third type of redshift, which is cosmological redshift. As photons are moving through an expanding universe, they themselves are stretched like a rubber band that we drew a waveform on. So there are three types of redshift. There are only the one blue shift from the Doppler effect. Two of these uh, actions can only take energy away from the relevant object and not get, give it to the photons. All right. 
So if the universe has been expanding this whole time, and it's getting colder and less dense over time, then what we can do is rewind, because this colder and less dense is really the, the core idea of the, the whole expanding universe model. As anything starts to expand, it cools off and it gets less dense. Less dense is by definition what's happening when we expand. So if we rewind time, we are talking about looking back at a universe that is getting hotter and more dense at all parts, every single region, not just collapsing to a point, but every single part of the infinite universe is getting hotter and denser. So rather than thinking about a single object that we crunch down, think about just raising the temperature and somehow raising the density at all parts of this universe. That is the more relevant way to think about this. In the first few seconds after the time we call the Big Bang, the universe was so hot and so dense that all energy was photons. We didn't have anything that we could call matter. It was just light in all parts of the infinite universe. In the first few minutes, the photons were able to create matter and antimatter. There's a kind of open question in science on how we ended up with slightly more matter. There's a matter-antimatter imbalance that is the only reason we're here today to be able to talk about it. That's outside the scope of our curriculum, but we do want to recognize that we should have expected equal amounts and we ended up with a little bit more matter. That matter turned into protons and neutrons and in the first few minutes, those protons were able to hit each other because we have a hot, dense environment just like the sun's core. We have fusion happening at all parts of the entire universe just like it's currently happening in the sun's core. Some amount of helium was created as the temperature started to drop and the density started to drop, fusion turned off. And when fusion turned off, we just had the amount of stuff 75% hydrogen and 25% helium that is very similar to the amount of stuff we have now. It was too dense still though to let light freely pass so all of that's happening and it's churning but we don't have the light from that moment in time or that phase in time. In the same way, the exact same way that we cannot look inside the sun. The sun's photosphere, we learned, was the surface of the sun, which simply means that we can't look deeper. There is a portion of time that we cannot look deeper and see. But in the same way that the sun does have a photosphere, it does have a point at which the temperatures and densities dropped enough, the whole universe has this moment in time that acts like a photosphere as well, that acts as the point that we can actually look back at and see. If we look at these temperatures and times, I want us to recognize that the scales are intense and we don't need to talk about all of the different details in this image, but I do want to note that um, those tiny negative uh, exponent numbers the red, orange, dark yellow, and light yellow times are all happening in the first second after the Big Bang. So as we talk about electrons forming and atoms forming, we are now talking about minutes of time and hours of time, uh, and then the temperature has been dropping ever since. So as the universe continued to cool, we get to that moment that is like the sun's photosphere where finally light can freely stream. And it would be the entire universe that was at that temperature, the entire universe experienced a specific moment in time where that light can freely stream outward. That happened 400,000 years after the Big Bang, which seems like a lot, but the universe is 13.8 billion years old, so that's actually kind of shortly after the Big Bang. So we don't get the baby pictures of the universe, but we do get um, toddlerhood and onward. So it's also a little bit like seeing the edge of the clouds on a cl uh, cloudy day. Um, that's an image that uh, helps us kind of connect to the textbook. But it's actually even better to uh, compare it to the sun's photosphere, where behind that photosphere, it's too hot and dense. We can't see past that. And in front of that photosphere, it's clear enough to let light travel. 
The photons from this hot, dense photosphere of the universe have been traveling to us ever since. And when they were traveling to us, they started at a um, black body radiation temperature, just like the sun, a black body radiation temperature of the universe that was about 3000 degrees when we use Wien's law and that peak wavelength. But we've identified that those photons are traveling through expanding universe. They have been cosmologically redshifted an intense amount because they've been traveling for 13 and a half billion years. And so they have shifted from being maybe peaking in the infrared to now peaking way off in microwaves. And that is called the cosmic microwave background. So the cosmic microwave background, the CMB, is the glow that tells us that the universe used to be hot and dense. It is the definitive observation that tells us the universe was hot and dense and we see it in all directions. So every part of the infinite universe was hot and dense in the past. So we now have four statements that we know about the universe. It has infinite size, no edge, no center. It has a finite age, 13.8 billion years. It's expanding. That comes from the hubble lemaitre law. That comes from observations of Doppler shift. And it began hot and dense. And the relevant piece of observation that tells us it had to have began hot and dense is the cosmic microwave background, which we see in all directions. So before we continue, let's take a breath and um, kind of think about what our current understanding is of the Big Bang, that first moment in time. Because we've, we've talked about it a little bit, but I know it's tough to think about. So read those two statements and kind of decide for yourself which one seems to fit your understanding better about that moment called the Big Bang. So if you chose option one, that's what a lot of like videos in, in public media posts um, indicate, the name seems to indicate that, but I need you to understand that if all you're picturing is that um, matter and energy is exploding from a single spot, you have given that single spot um, priority, that that spot is where the universe came from and not over here. And if that spot is where everything came from, that would have to be the center of the universe. But we have already acknowledged that we cannot have a center of the universe. So option one is inconsistent with the facts that we have already written down. And we need to come to terms with the fact that we, ca we have to let go of this misconception of it being an explosion. No explosion. The universe was hotter and denser and it has been expanding and cooling ever since. That is what the Big Bang Theory is. That is why we want to call it the expanding universe model. That is the takeaway for what the Big Bang is, the expansion and cooling of the universe from an originally hot and dense state. That's why in our um, pyramid, we wanna identify that it began hot and dense, that's relevant, but that's it. We don't need to um, talk about any explosions. There wasn't a big explosion at the very beginning. So our next big question that we're thinking about is what is the universe made out of? This chart shows our current best estimates. Uh, this is a kind of work in progress because over the last several decades, this has changed significantly. We're not going to get into a lot of detail about this. We're not going to um, memorize the numbers, uh, but we want to identify that this pie chart contains three things, ordinary matter, so that's you, me, the computer you're watching this on, um, the table that it's sitting on, all the stars, all the gas and dust. That's the 5% slice of the pie. Then we have dark matter. We first identified dark matter as being part of the Milky Way halo because we can see how it um, has effects on gravita gravity and orbits. And then dark energy, which is a def different part of the pie because it doesn't have any gravitational effects. So 
The reason why we want to identify that this is a work in progress is because if you go back just a couple of decades, our understanding has drastically changed. In the 1970s, um, the fact that we're calling it ordinary dark matter meant we thought that it was maybe planets that weren't shining or black holes or something that has gravity but is an object that comes out of protons and neutrons and electrons. By the 1980s, we realized that it cannot be made of the things that we think of as atoms and elements. And in the 1990s, when we learned that the universe was not only expanding, but speeding up, we had to come up with a placeholder name for what we meant by that speeding up. So dark energy is just really a placeholder name for the thing pushing back against gravity to make us accelerate our expansion. So dark matter is still an open question. There are dozens of experiments that are either currently running or being built trying to detect dark matter as the, um, the particle that we have not yet kind of named or identified. It can't be made of atoms. Um, the best candidate would be something that is similar to neutrinos, but neutrinos don't quite work. Um, and so we're, we're still kind of figuring out what that looks like. So keep an eye on science, uh, science news. That'll be something that uh, within our own lifetimes, I think we'll know more about. Now, for this idea of the universe expanding, it's uh, something that we, we confidently know from the 1920s onward that the universe is expanding. But only since 1996 have we really understood that the universe is accelerating that expansion. So imagine you're driving in a car on the highway, that's you driving, but now imagine that you're pressing on the gas pedal. Now you're accelerating. We are speeding up how we expand. So one of the leading explanations is that there's something that acts like negative pressure, something that acts to push against gravity, and that something, that unknown something, is called dark energy. So when we think about everything we've talked about, this is a lot of information. And we want to recognize that the big takeaway from this whole video is just that we have written down these different statements, these basic facts about the universe. And we have something that indicates the observation that led to that. So let's start from the bottom. The infinite size, the observation is actually that we had to define the universe that way. So we have to build the pyramid from a foundation and our foundation is the way we define the capital U universe. Finite age is because we see that the sky is dark, that light takes time to travel to us. So that's our kind of first observation that tells us it can't have existed forever. It's expanding. That comes from measurements of the Doppler effect, the Hubble Lemaitre law. Those are observations that support that statement. Began hot and dense. The observation that supports that statement is the cosmic microwave background. So that's the pyramid that we had built uh, the last time we checked in. Now, that contains dark matter, the observation that supports that statement are things like the rotation curve of the Milky Way galaxy. The way that things gravitationally um, interact tells us how much mass is there, and there is definitely more mass than what we could visibly see. So we've got observations that support the idea of dark matter. And then it has accelerating expansion. As we look at more and more distant um, objects using type 1a supernova as standard candles, we see that the um, expansion rate in the past was lower and currently is higher. So it's kind of like you're sitting in the car and you look down at your speedometer and you're going 75 miles an hour, but you know that you were going 65 miles per hour the last time that you looked. That's how you know you're accelerating because the past was slower and the current is faster. And then there's no top to this pyramid because all of this is ongoing. This is actually the closest that we get to the edge of human knowledge out of any of the topics that we cover this semester. So I am, I am glad that you've been on this journey with me. I know it's a lot, but that's all that I need us to take away is this pyramid of facts. And I look forward to finishing up this semester with you thinking about life in the universe. Thanks for watching.